Hi, this is Paul, and I've got good news for Julian and the Welders. It's going to be a long one. A while ago, I saw this meme, uh, the Avengers Intellectual Dark Web, and I didn't pay a lot of attention to it, but I made a copy of it so I could, so I could find it again and just kind of squirreled it away. I might have used it in a previous video, too. But this morning I was thinking about, as I was putting this video together, I was thinking about where Peterson was in this, and I thought, well, he should probably be Doctor Strange. And so I pulled up the, the graphic, and sure enough, there he is. Peterson is Doctor Strange in the Avengers Intellectual Dark Web. And in this video, I'm going to try to explain why he is and why that matters and how this thing works together. Now, lately, Rebel Wisdom has really been hitting the ball out of the park uh, David Fuller and company have been doing an outstanding job of putting together interviews and posting content almost daily. People sometimes scream that they can't keep up with my content. Well, I can't keep up with David's content. He's putting so much good stuff out so fast, I can I can barely process it all. Now, with with some of the with some of the big names that he's putting up, though, I don't want you to miss this interview he did with Heather with Heather Hying. I guess that's how you say her name. I don't know. But this was this this interview was really a gem, and there is there is a lot of really good stuff in this. Now, I know when I do a little critique of some of these things, some of you get a little defensive for the uh, for all the people that I critique, and you know I understand that. I got put on the lights. There we go. Now you can see me see me a little better. And I understand that these are some of your faves, and if I hit your your boy or your girl, then then you'll be upset. But the critique is just in the spirit of all of us thinking better and challenging each other. Because truth is, I have a tremendous amount of respect for uh, these characters and the points they bring, and they teach me a ton all the time. But there's always a little bit on the side that I think oh, I, I I don't know about that. I want to talk about that. So I think that's very true of this Heather Hying interview. She said some stuff, and the way she said some stuff that was I thought so courageous and nuanced that I I was I, I listen to this stuff when I'm doing all kinds of stuff that you can't read. So I'm I was actually in the supermarket doing a little bit of shopping when I was listening to this interview and I thought, wow, this is a courageous woman. The kinds of things she is saying, the her capacity for truth and nuance I thought was was tremendous. The the part of the video I want to bring out now though is her description of the oops Please, please, no, I didn't. Oh, it's coming up. Okay. The the description of the internet and the intellectual dark web. Now, the the IDW or the intellectual dark web was a term coined by Eric Weinstein, which is Heather's brother-in-law. Okay, and he talked about it as an alternative sense-making community. Now, in a little tiny little video I posted, I was I was kvetching about institutions and someone left a comment about institution I don't understand the difference between institutions and corporations I think I do understand the difference between institutions and corporations and we're going to talk more about that in this video because watching this conversation with respect to institutions is vital and I'm going to be playing a significant portion of a conversation the last conversation with just Dave Rubin and Eric Weinstein, and Eric goes into institutions at a deeper level there. And one of the big takeaway quotes from that is that I don't want to crack the shells just to get some hermit, some bad hermit crabs out. And so Eric, Eric does have an understanding about institutions. My question is, is how well he understands by coining the term intellectual dark web and by naming names and framing this group together that he has in fact started an institution and not a corporation, but the ways in which institutions, even without corporations, create cre create create forks, create challenging positions that rely upon common foundations. And in a lot of this video, we're going to get into some of those common foundations and what they mean, especially in terms of what George Marsden, I'm going to be using one of his books. George Marsden is a terrific historian. He actually was a teacher of, of mine at Calvin College. He went on and I don't remember if it was Yale or Harvard that he was last teaching at. But George Marsden, if you want to look into especially religious history 
in America. George Har George Marsden is one of the best. If I'm going to do a little plug, you can check out his his biography of Jonathan Edwards, which is not a small book, but a, a really wonderful book. I read this book a, a number of years ago, and now I just messed up my shelf. But anyway, so Eric coined intellectual dark um, intellectual dark web. And on Rubin, he wants to save the shells, the corporations, but get the crabs out. Uh, free speech affords three free thought. And I think Peterson has made this point very, very well. Unrestricted by institutional corporate restrictions. Now, this has been bouncing around in my head listening to Ben Shapiro's two conversations, one with John MacArthur and the other with Bishop Barron. And I think, and I'll, play, I'll pull that in a little bit later in this video too, that's where you begin to see some of this question of okay speech and institutions how how do how do the institutional demands of the community corporate or not it's often with corporations that they get that there's bite often because of employment how do those restrictions play into the need for ongoing thought and change now one of the one of the best sections in the Jordan Peterson Sam Harris conversations was when Jordan Peterson I think was very deftly describing how any change is dangerous and no change is dangerous you have to change but that's always dangerous and you don't want to change but not changing is also dangerous in other words that there's dangers everywhere and Peterson has that great little great little segment right in one of those and I didn't pull up the video but it's in there you can find it it's on Google no it's actually on YouTube but but you can find it so free speech affords three free thought unrestricted by institutions or corporate restrictions and actually Heather talks about that a little bit in this video even though I'm not going to play that portion and this is especially important for Brett Heather and Jordan Jordan is on, I assume he continues to be on leave, but still formally connected to the University of Toronto. Brett and Heather obviously were exiled by the entire, by that whole thing that happened at Evergreen University. So let's let Heather frame the IDW a little bit here and hear what she has to say. And one of the doors that has opened is the intellectual dark web which has a door that's a new metaphor yeah what you're you're in the intellectual dark web according to the New York Times I, I guess well and it is the arbiter of truth yeah um, so what do you see the IDW as what, what's your frame for the IDW I don't I haven't formalized a frame for it uh, it feels like a an, a true recognition of an aggregation of individuals and ways of approaching intellectual disagreement and conversation that at the time that Barry Weiss wrote that article in May of 2018 um, many of us knew each other many of us didn't um, in terms of just the people that she names in that article um, you know to varying degrees and I still haven't met some of them. We, if you take those people as some, uh, they're just a named subset, um, politically very diverse, uh, developmentally from a lot of different backgrounds, how it is that they're making their mark in the world is pretty diverse, although maybe somewhat less so. There are a lot of podcasters um, among them. Uh, and people interviewing and you know really having conversations um, as a way of making their way in the world which is maybe one of the unifying things about um, about what the IDW is to the degree that it is a thing people who who engage ideas broadly and who are willing to sit down with ideas well that would be me that they have the background <laughs> have the training have the authority It is, it is very much of the moment, I think, uh, and I hope that it remains of the moment. The, the clear hunger that there is for people to be simultaneously pointed in their critique with evidence to back up what they say or a hypothesis test with which you might assess whether or not what I'm saying is true, 
always with respect and compassion and a refusal to conflate the individual with the argument, I think is perhaps the right encapsulation of what, what the group is. Um, therefore, people in the group and you know, many, 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 many others besides um, tend to reject orthodoxy, tend to reject ideology, tend to be interested in first principles thinking, meaning that uh, if you, you, you don't take something on faith, you try to figure out if that's true, what else must be true? Let me see how far back I can go in the logic tree and see what basic assumption sits at the floor of that, such that if I have to start questioning this thing here, I've already done this backwards logic. <clears throat> and I can, as, as this starts to falter, I can go back. Is this faltering too? Is this faltering? And maybe it's the assumption. Maybe it's the basic fundamental assumption of whatever it is that you believe. And you know, not, all, not all beliefs are subject to that. There are, some, there are some that you just can't do that with, some issues that really are questions of, but I simply, I simply do believe that it is immoral, say, to kill an unborn child. I don't, but you know, that, that will be a belief that some people hold, and there's like, what would the assumption be at the base of that? I don't, I don't find one, right? Um, but uh, addressing questions of what life is, and what the barriers around life are, like all of those questions can be assessed scientifically. And being willing to go in and being willing, not, you don't have to be excited, but being willing to be wrong, being willing to be publicly wrong even, and to have to, or to be very wrong in the moment and not know it, and come back and say, screwed up, looked into it, or someone else revealed to me, this is a thing that I thought because of these things, and turns out, no. So that, that is tough for most people to do for psychological reasons, but it's also something that we have almost no experience. That is, that was a really helpful framing, culture framing little discourse she gave us. And, and the reason I say that is because it's a pastor, part of what you do as a pastor is that you're always trying to steward one description of a pastor that I often tell people who are thinking about the ministry or trying to get into it. Pastors are stewards of the community culture. And, and that is often best done, not overtly or directly, and especially not tyrannically, but it's best done usually with some watchful waiting to, to look for moments in which a lot happens, you just go, go, go. And then you see the moment, it's at a critical juncture, and then you point it out. And you say, this is what we're about. This is what we're not about. And if, in fact, you have developed over time authority within the community and that authority is earned, that's how pastors shape the culture of a community. And I thought what she laid out here was very much a, a descriptive definition of the culture that the IDW is trying to promote. Let's take a look at that a little more closely. Refuses to conflate the individual with the argument. Yeah, we 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 go at it. We go at it fierce. We go at ideas fiercely, but we treat people with gentleness and respect. That's that's a that's a really important one, I think. And, and that's, that's, that one, that's one that I think has implicit within it the idea of people as image bearers. And so we, we treat people with respect, even though ideas we go at with ferocity. First, principle, uh, first principles thinking, if you don't take something on faith, you try to figure, um, you don't take something on faith, you try to figure out if that's true, what else must be true, follow it back, maybe it's the basic assumption. So now this is where we get into some enlightenment and some American culture. Well, you, you'll find this, you'll find this in movies all the time. Well, I don't believe something just because someone tells it to me. Well, what they usually do is they don't believe something because this person told it to them. But the entire audience, when they hear that, thinks, oh, yeah, that sounds good. The, the greatest example of this is Steve Jobs' Stanford commencement address. 
Blaze your own trail. Do your own thing. Don't buy anyone's dogma. Oh, Steve, that's a great idea. I'll do what you say. It's it's self-referentially inconsistent. And and but that's a common trick in American culture. Uh, Neo says it in in The Matrix. I don't like thinking that I'm not, basically I don't like thinking that I'm not captain of my own destiny. Yeah, that's right. You don't like thinking it, but you're also not realizing how many ways you, in fact, are not captain of your own destiny and how many of these chic ideas, just because you saw James Dean strike a pose or Han Solo looked so daring in his, with, his, with his blaster and his Millennial Falcon that somewhere deep inside your mind you thought, I want to be just like him. And, well, you're saying, I don't, I'm not going to believe it because anybody says it. Well, are you going to believe that because someone said it? because it's the same thing but again we don't we're not self-conscious we don't see ourselves we don't we don't understand when we hear these things now she she immediately takes that and she kind of pulls it back but not all beliefs are subject to that there are some beliefs that I don't question that are simply immoral for example to kill an unborn child and she says well that's not one of mine and, and so she is in a sense she, she's trying to calibrate where she's at on the political spectrum even though and i think she's quite right i think part of what we're seeing with the idw is the is the breaking down of the left right spectrum that has dominated american politics for a generation at least since reagan and and i think the election of Donald Trump was another piece of that, that the old left-right spectrums, well, they're coming down. And so then you're in this liminal space where everything is tohu wavohu and a lot of chaos. And then the idea is that out of this, some new order will emerge. And the question is what? And in these spaces where the new order is up for grabs, well, that's when everybody gets grabby. So scientifically, that comes through again and again. Many of them are scientists and I think as Rachel Brown noted in The Three Craters, that holds a tremendous amount of power in our particular in our particular context. Willing to be publicly wrong. Again, this is very American culture. It is and it isn't. We don't see politicians do it, but there, there's always a double Joe Rogan, I think, said something something to this effect on one of his shows. There's always kind of a there's always kind of a double bind with this kind of thing that if you're if you're someone who likes to change his mind, well, then you flip flop and you're wishy washy. If you're not someone who changes their mind, well, then you're stuck in the you're stuck in the mud. So you know, there's always a a, a lose lose that can go on with this game. But she elevates it here as a as a major thing to change your mind in public. Uh, tends to reject orthodoxy. Tends to reject ideology. Again, this is this is very this is very American. Now, when I say it's very American, I'm not saying that as a criticism. I'm just identifying it that it's it's contextualized when this with this within a specific culture, and there's good things about that, and there's bad things about that. But it's it's helpful to see it, especially as how I'm going to, over the course of this video, demonstrate where this lies in a more historic in a broader historical frame in terms of the development of American culture and where things have been going in terms of American institutional life. Not beholden to institutional speech restrictions or demands. She didn't say that there, but she'll say that later. And this is something that 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 Eric has noted in a number of places. Now again, Brett and, and Heather have been freed from that basically by being dismissed and shown the door from from Evergreen. Much of the IDW, especially the Weinstein um, the Weinstein faction, are very American and very much a product of the 1960s. Now, again, the 1960s, we often say the 60s as if it was from 60 to 69. Actually, in America, the 60s were from 65 to 75. I'll talk about that a little bit later. So let's look a little bit at social history and the cohorts. Peak modernity is really between Darwin and World War I, and that's a, that's a, that's a piece of the West. Now, all of these are, are loose terms, and, and they're by no means, uh, don't get too literalistic with them. You have the chaos years of World War I through World War II, where you have booms and busts in the middle. Then you have the Cold War from 46 to 87. And then we have what I call the Pax Americana. We'll see usually these things are about the, the waning years of an, of an imperial reign. And it's, it's too early to know where this is going. 
but 87 to the presence, where the, where the United States is the sole superpower. And, you know, we could even just say 1987 until Trump, with Trump pulling back from the globalism that pretty much every regime and administration has maintained until Trump. And Trump has, has sort of continued to defend that. The institutions continue to, but Trump with his qualms about about NATO and other other partners not pulling their weight and he criticizes Canada in a sense worse than he criticizes Russia, so on and so forth. So the Pax Americana. But then there's these generational cohorts. 80, uh, 96 to the present, Gen Z or iGen or Centennials, 77 to 95, again about a 20 year span, the Millennials or Gen Y. Notice the Gen Xers, that's only, that's only a 10 year span, 65 to 76. Baby Boomers, 46 to 64 and before the Baby Boomers were the Builders. Okay, why am I laying these things out? Let's take a look at who we're talking about in the IDW. They're tweeners, okay, and I should know because I'm one of them. I was born in 63, I'm 55 years old, so I'm a year younger than Jordan Peterson, and I'm two years older than Eric Weinstein, and I'm six years older than his younger son, Brett, and I'm four years older than Sam Harris. These are, these are tweeners. These are, these are born at the end of the baby boom generation and at the beginning of the Gen X generation. And so part of what I think we're seeing here with the IDW is, in fact, a generational cohort movement that's underway and as is common with these cohorts there's a transition going on it's usually a critique of the parents and a coming into your own in terms of institutional power and that usually happens around your 50s in terms of your career trajectory and your status it's usually in your 50s that you begin to reach the peak or you do peak at where you're going to go in terms of your your public influence your career so on and so forth and and I think that's a helpful thing to remember in terms of the IDW now let's take a look at a little bit of 20th century social history um, wild swings of uncertainty the 20th century was a wild century and we don't know what the 21st century is going to look like but wild swings of certainty excess and crisis the late 19th century certainties of religion and science again they were very much seen as a fusion at the end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century you can read about that if you want to read with the history of the Oneida community very interesting history if you want to read the history of the First World War from a religious perspective perspective huge swings. You had the, the booming and the busting of the 20s and 30s, and you had the existential crisis of the Second World War. But now from the 50s to the 70s, things were very interesting. The 50s in the United States is, is often looked back on as a sort of golden age. But if you actually read a lot of what was happening in the 50s, there was a fair amount of anxiety. It was, in fact, the height of the Cold War. And American society, while enjoying the the prosperity and the hegemony that its its victories in World War II afforded it, there, were, there was very much a sense in the 1950s that the institutional man, as they call him, the, the churchman or the company man, were non-player characters. Okay, And so then the 1960s became, uh, again, 65 to 75, became this struggle between orthodoxy and freedom. Now, a really wonderful book that bears this out is written by George Marsden. I mentioned him a little bit earlier in the video. And here are the table of contents. National purpose, mass media and the national character, freedom in the lonely crowd, enlightenment's end, building without foundations, the problem of authority, two masters, the latter days of the Protestant establishment, and the sequel consensus becoming a fighting word. And in some ways, Marsden nicely shows how the 50s became the 60s. Now, I read this book in 2014, and back before YouTube and many of you came into my life, I was a nice, I lived a nice, quiet, hobbit-like existence here in my little hobbit hole in Sacramento, and I blogged, and just a few friends read my blogs, and one of the things that I did with my blog was I just, you would write book reviews about the kinds of books that I wrote. And one of the things I wrote in, in December 
20, 2014. Oh my goodness, it's just about four years ago. Look at that. Why neither the religious right nor the secular left can address Americans, American religious pluralism. Combatants in civil wars are usually relatives, fighting over something both sides wish to share. George Marsden, without addressing it directly, attempts to trace back the roots of the present culture war to the time when cousins were allies fighting common foes. That's the Cold War. When Americans chart the times of the second half of the 20th century, the calendar is less than helpful. The 1950s lasted 20 years, from 45 to 65 or World War II to Vietnam, and the 60s were from 65 to 75. Of the two, the 60s get all the attention. Protests, hippies, drugs, war, fighting the man, finding yourself. Marston wants to pause the lefty boomer nostalgia trip or the religious rights grunge match to ponder how the 60s got started. For historian, it's in the 50s, of course. According to Marsden, the seeming utopia of the 1950s was not settled in as happy days. Some of you my age will remember that old sitcom. It was an age of imagined continuity with America's Enlightenment founders. Pay attention how much you hear the Enlightenment coming up in the IDW conversations. My argument is that the mainstream thinkers of the 1950s can be better understood if we see them as standing in far more continuity with the cultural assumptions of the founders than would be true of most mainstream thinkers today. At the same time, the discontinuities between their assumptions and those of the founders were formidable. Consequently, their hopes of providing a common ground for cultural consensus could not be long sustained. So what you see in the 50s, again, is the breakdown of cultural consensus, which will be borne out in the 60s in quite a bit of inter intracultural feuding, which is what we have today. They took for granted as self-evident many of the founders' assumptions regarding human freedom, self-determination, and equality of rights. In fact, their hopes for strengthening the American consensus were built around the faith that America could be united on the basis of these evolving shared ideals. They also shared with 18th century leaders a confidence that rational and scientific understandings were essentially objective and therefore could be normative. If you go back to my much repeated talk about what happened in the wake of the Protestant Reformation, how we sought certainty in empiricism or rationalism slash idealism, this is working its way through in American society in the 50s, this long breath of relaxation after the bitter fight of World War II. Most believe most, be, most of them believe that applying natural scientific methods and empirically based rationality to understanding society was one of the best ways to promote human flourishing. Sound familiar? That's essentially Sam Harris's thesis. The public intellectuals, mostly WASP or Jewish, now if you just read Ross Duthoth's piece on George H.W. Bush's funeral, about, in a sense, looking back wistfully to the WASP generation. Well, there it is. Mostly WASP or Jewish were anxious about the consensus that seemed so solid. These anxieties would germinate and seed the social upheaval of the 60s. When the consensus culture collapsed in the 1960s and 1970s, taking with it all but the vestiges of the old Protestant establishment, this was the church that was dying when young Jordan Peterson was going to church. That collapse initiated, among other things, a religious crisis. Formal recognition of Christianity, as in public school prayers and observances, declined at the same time. There were tumultuous changes in mores and a questioning of the shared patriotism that had characterized the 1940s and 1950s. This combination led at first to a cultural backlash, and then by the later 1970s to the rise of the religious right and the initiation of the culture wars. Although I do not attempt, this is Marsden speaking again, I'm quoting, although I do not attempt a full account of these developments here, I do offer an overview to illustrate how they may be illuminated by viewing them in the context of the demise of the consensus culture of the 1950s and the rise of the idea of taking back America by restoring, by restoring a, quote, a lost, quote, Christian consensus. That's George Mar Marsden's The Twilight of the American Enlightenment, the 1950s, and the Crisis of Liberal Beliefs, basic books. So here I summarize Marsden's narrative. 
While the above was interesting enough to get you to buy the book, when Marsden goes on, uh, where Marsden goes with this is more interesting still. In some ways, if I recall correctly, this is there's kind of two books in this book. I'm surprised the editors didn't, you know, force him to kind of bring them together. But I'll leave that there. I'll try to I'll try I'll try to briefly outline his narrative. Most post World War II cultural leaders saw themselves in continuity with the Enlightenment fathers who founded the nation. There was among the mostly WASP and Jewish leaders a consensus about the good, and it was assumed that this consensus could be built on and incrementally broadened to be more inclusive as the 1950s American America began to awaken to its native outsiders. The 1950s, after World War II, the, Brit, the Brits were beginning to dismantle their empire. They were, de they were dealing with pluralism in that way. In the United States, we were dealing with the civil rights crisis. How, ha, how had this great narrative march westward and great narrative march of freedom and independence left behind the descendants of African slaves, trampled on the rights of the original, the original inhabitants of the land, for example? Just as this consensus was blindsided by the cultural struggles so it was by the resurgence of vigorous religious faith and pluralism as it roared into the public square in the form of the religious right. The religious right, too, however, had implicitly embraced parts of the older consensus. I'm thinking about whether I set up the mic properly, so I'm going to pause here and check. Yeah, the mic was set up correctly. Now I have to edit because I had to save what I previously did before. That's just on the back end. Okay. The consensus, however, was naively assumed. What consensus? I'll just start reading my bullet points again. Most post-World War II cultural leaders saw themselves in continuity with the Enlightenment founders who founded the nation. There was among the most wa there was one there was among the mostly WASP and Jewish leaders a consensus about the good, and it was assumed that this consensus would be built on and incrementally broadened to be more inclusive, as in the 1950s American as 1950s America began to awaken to its native outsiders. This consensus, however, was naively assumed, supported by a secularization narrative that asserted that pre-enlightenment sectarian religion would continue to fade away. That's Sam Harris's position. They also naively assumed that an incremental approach towards racial reconciliation and gender liberation would progress slowly and naturally. In other words, they were not prepared for the 1960s. The 1960s showed the 50s and 60s, really, in terms of the, in terms of both, that um, these native outsiders, so to speak, weren't going to wait. Just as this consensus was blindsided by the civil rights struggle, so, so it was by the resurgence of vigorous religious faith and pluralism as it roared into the public square in the form of the religious right. Okay, because this, the, the secularization narrative assumed religion was just going to fade away and continue to be marginalized and disappear, which is what they saw happening in the mainline churches. And then when the religious right came on board, they were in shock. And that was, in a sense, one of the first shocks. It was a, it was a shock in the nature of the Donald Trump election was a shock. The religious right, too, however, had implicitly embraced parts of the older consensus in its nostalgic and naive look backwards into the 50s and their attempt to seize power in the 1980s. While America, um, while America did a lot of work to create a space for pluralism in race, class, and gender, neither the old establishment of the 50s and their, and their heirs and their heirs, nor the new religious right, had any idea what to do with the realities of religious pluralism. And that struggle continues today across the board. Marsden will conclude, um, will conclude the book by offering an approach to religious pluralism as he sees in Abraham Kuyper. Now this is, if you grew up in the Christian Reformed Church, or if you were educated at a place like Calvin College, or Dort College, which is a Christian Reformed College in in Northwest Iowa, Kuiper is the answer to all of our pluralism problems. And you can hear 
you can see Kuiper brought out by James K. Smith, sometimes by some of the people Tim Keller talked to from the Dutch Reformed tradition. I'm not going to get into Kuiper right now, but that's where Marsden ends. And most folks from my tradition will, at the end of the story, bring forward Abraham Kuiper as offering some help to figure out a way forward. Okay, let's, here we go. Marsden displayed his gift for summary as he grapples with these broad movements that many of us lived through. I often found his description and analysis fair, clear, and insightful. Like all histori historians, he writes about the past in the middle of the same storms that all of us are seated within today. The narratives in play today have their roots in our recent history, and Marsden is very clear, fair, and illuminating on these. As a culture, we quickly glide past the questions of what is good and demand, how can we get it now? Okay, this is, in many ways, the besetting sin of Sam Harris and what I've pointed out often with Brett Weinstein's analysis of, well, we can correct our programming as assassin robots and choose to do what's good. Uh, Brett, how do you know what's good? Because really, the question that's being asked here is, what is good? And you don't answer that question by saying, oh, we can do the good and we can do it now. It doesn't work that way. If you want to see how this works out, just look around. Another quote from Marston. That often subtle message, that it was better to trust yourself than to follow sub-communities or they, their tradition. Do you hear, that, hear a little bit of that in the IDW? It's, it's much stronger in the secret sacred self, but that trust yourself is, in a sense, always in a little bit of tension with science. So I'll repeat. That often subtle message that it was better to trust yourself than to follow sub-communities or their traditions um, was symptomatic of the way that mid-century mainstream consensus-minded culture most often dealt with diversity and pluralism. A chorus of voices, including the most progressive mainline Protestant leadership, affirmed a flexible, inclusive pluralism as one of the great virtues of the mainstream American life. At mid-century, American society still had a long way to go before it was truly inclusive. But the ideal was at least in place that openness and tolerance were, held, were essential to a healthy, thriving society. To truly be pluralistic meant to be open-minded rather than sectarian and dogmatic. Now, I think the IDW would very much agree with that statement. The difficulty about that is if your path towards pluralism is the admonition to be yourself, which you can hear trotted out in just about any commencement address, you're going to have a problem. Because discover yourself, be yourself, find yourself, find the true self within. Well, all of this goes to, well, I feel more like Shirley Temple than like a 55-year-old bald man. And I'd really like to sing and dance on the good ship Lollipop. I really find that to be my true self. Well, why? Because it feels authentic from the inside. Because I wish to not be a non-player character. I want to be unique and genuine and authentic and me. All the while completely forgetting that me was formed by all the little iterations of me up until now. And that secret sacred self might just be a part of your consciousness community that isn't within your consciousness sphere. Where does that come from? Marsden exposes the fact that this is naive. What if the community has significant differences concerning what the good really is? This, of course, is the reality of religious pluralism. Want an illustration? Find a boomer woman who is, who is sufficiently liberated in the 1970s and introduce her to a young woman who converted to Christianity into a complementarian church or even Islam. The boomer woman has no category for contemplating this choice. Surely the young convert must be under the spell of some unenlightened, bigoted man. How um, how could a woman choose to embrace a religious tradition that violates the great narrative of progress? Well, 
This is what we saw come full flourishing in the ISIS movement. Marsden is dead on right that the American Enlightenment assumed that these were problems it, could, it would never have to face or could simply wait out. No rational woman would choose to freely embrace a community that demanded she submit to a man. Did, didn't we resolve this, they exclaim? And I get this illustration sitting down with a woman who came from a denominational study and was meeting me here in California and was talking to me. And I made the comment, well, you know, uh, one of the things that's happening is that young women are choosing to go back to older forms of choosing to go back to older forms of gender complementarity and they're finding a certain amount of what you might call liberation in this and this woman just was completely bewildered I have that also sometimes when I'll explain yeah some of the newer church plants are complementarian and not egalitarian on whether or not women will hold church office and many women are shocked we thought history only go went this way and so all of the kids would be in agreement with what we thought when we came to our consensus when we were 60 years old nope they have their own brains Marsden is just as fair with the right as he is with the left when the religious right emerged as an organized political movement in the late 1970s it too had been had been recounted lacked attention to the as has been recounted, lacked, lacked attention to the question of how to ensure equity for widely diverse voices in the, in the public domain. Even though militantly conservative Christians had not been part of the liberal pro Protestant establishment of the 1950s, their instinct was to propose a return to something that would look a lot like it. But with conservatives, just as themselves, in charge of defining the cultural consensus. The religious right could, um, could encompass some internal religious diversity since it included culturally conservatives, Catholics, Mormons, Orthodox Jews, and others. Look at the Daily Wire. That's pretty much a redux in many ways of the religious right of the 1980s. And maybe I'm wrong with that and correct me in the comments, but I don't know much about them, so I'm, I'm totally happy to be wrong in public about that. But that's kind of my take with the little bit I've heard from Ben Shapiro. Yet what it glaringly lacked, especially in the popular Protestant zeal to, to return America to its allegedly Christian roots, were accounts of how such a proposed restoration would deal with greater diversity, even either religious or secular. Militantly conservative Protestants just getting over their belligerent anti-Catholicism did not have a heritage of thinking about such issues beyond the Baptist principles of separation of church and state. And you heard some of that in, in John MacArthur's conversation with Ben Shapiro. Because MacArthur is of that religious right generation. That's when he came to power in many ways. They now spoke of secular humanists as though they were the enemy to be excluded in, America, in Christianized America. Conservative Roman Catholics had a religious heritage in which, until recently, it had been held that, ideally, Catholicism should be the state religion. That meant that Catholics were only just beginning to address questions of how to deal equitably with religious and cultural diversity. And now if you listen to Bishop Barron talk with Ben Shapiro in their interview, you see Bishop Barron dealing with some of those issues, where you wouldn't have Protestants deal with those issues, because... The Protestant churches that helped found America did not have the same hegemic tradition that the Roman Catholic Church had had. In fact, I think we're probably now seeing some of that coming to terms with the Orthodox churches growing in America as they're leaving countries where, in the, far, in the further distant past, they had hegemic state authority built into them. What happened with the Soviet Union was that was pretty much stripped away and in many places in the world, they're just clinging on for survival. That meant that Catholics were only just beginning to, ad to address questions of how to deal equitably with religious and cultural diversity. Some serious conservative theorists, both Catholic and Protestant, did indeed provide some valuable engagement with these issues. 
but the more popular manifestations of the religious right, their nuanced voices were often drowned out by strident and simplistic calls for a return to America's original Christian consensus. And what that usually blankets over is the complexity of deism and Thomas Jefferson's faith and what exactly the, the characters of late 18th century religious colonials actually looked like in terms of their religious beliefs. What this means is that neither the right nor the left have any idea what to do with religious pluralism in America. The left wants to shut their eyes, hunker down, and hope their secularization narrative will sweep it away. That's Sam Harris. The right, now from its position of cultural weakness, takes up the new flag of liberal religious inclusivism. But mostly, and you hear this in a sense, when you listen to Ben Shapiro talk about values. Notice how, how many times in his conversations with, mostly with John MacArthur, because he shares a lot with MacArthur, but also with Bishop Barron, notice how much Ben Shapiro, who is an Orthodox Jew, pivots to include a bigger tent of Judeo-Christian values. This is what we can't agree on, the New Testament. We can't agree on Jesus. We, we really don't want to wade into this mess of religious pluralism, so let's agree on values, and then we can kind of sidestep the particulars of narratives where we will have differences. The right, now from its position of cultural weakness, takes up the new flag of liberal religious inclusivism, but mostly just for itself. Christian clubs at public universities, financial aid at Christian colleges, Hobby Lobby, etc. And for acceptable allies, Mormons, African American churches, conservative Jews, Roman Catholics, but not so much for others, Muslims, Buddhists, New Agers. If the culture is looking for broader inclu um, inclusivism, who has any confidence that the heirs of the religious light of the religious right will find the way forward? Marsden's solution is Abraham Kuyper. Many outside the CRC might find this to be a new and startling idea. Who is Abraham Kuyper, and what new light can he offer? Marsden will recommend the Center for Public Justice and the writings of Richard Mao. Richard Mao was a philosophy professor at Calvin College back in the heyday of Calvin College's philosophy department when it includes included Richard Richard Mao and Alvin Plantinga and and Nicholas Waltersdorf and when George Marsden was on the faculty at Calvin College and when the Reform Journal reached its height. Some of this stuff is a little bit more CRC than most of you know about. Okay, I'm sympathetic to all this. I'm a part of this tribe. I grew up watching my father read the Reform Journal and tell stories about Henry Staub. Last night I was pondering another blog blog project I thumbed my way through the best of the Reform Journal. Maybe I'll share some of those thoughts later. In any case, lobbing Abraham Kuyper into the fray is pretty much the move that James Bratt, another professor of Calvin College, calls the journalists, um, calls the journalists, meaning the tribe of the CRC left, whose golden age was expressed in the Reform Journal. Uh, how much of this is pertinent to this? I want to be a tribal loyalist but I think we're going to have to produce something more compelling than we have. I don't see the Christian Reformed Church seriously making progress or having amazing new answers to the challenge of religious pluralism. And I wrote some of this in 2014 when I was really wrestling with what at that point was the rise of what we might now call social justice warriors or some of that ethos in the CRC. In some ways, Marsden, I think, falls back with the evangelicals in looking back to the 50s, to the writings of Staub, Smead, Dane for light. Uh, James Dane, um, Lou Smeads. But that light has hardly grown brighter in the last 20 years. Calvin College is now reliant on the broader evangelical community for its attendance, but the CRC has yet to resolve its own internal struggles or show any signs of leading the way on any of these issues. I was very much looking forward to hearing Marsden put forward in the, uh, seeing what Marsden would put forward in the end, but I was disappointed. I love the work of my tribe, but we've hardly set the world on fire. The RJ, the Reform Journal tribe seems mostly spent and disillusioned. I don't mean to diminish the significant contributions our pantheon of guiding lights from our pantheon of guiding lights, but at this point we tend to be doing more assimilating than leading. Even though I thought Marsden at the at the payoff of the last, even though I think Marsden, at the payoff of the last chapter, I, 
I probably skipped a word in there. I never proofread my blogs. I still believe it's an important book. It's helpful in illuminating the landscape of our present cultural impasses. Marsden's gift shines as a historian. He shows why we have the struggles we've got, even if we didn't deliver the answer in a way I found compelling. So, great book. That was my review. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. I noted in this Shapiro having Bishop Barron and John MacArthur on. And in many ways, well, here we are in the 1980s when we're dealing with these issues. Bishop Barron, in many ways, articulating the new presence, the new denominational presence of the Roman Catholic Church on the American scene. John MacArthur showing some of what's out there in terms of modernist, fundamentalist, Protestant, megachurch, Southern California, Christianity. But note here, you've got late boomers and builders. Bishop Barron is 59 years old, built in, born in 1959. Uh, Peter Kreeft is 81, I didn't know that. John MacArthur is 79 years old, born in 1939. Uh, Barron is a late bloomer, and John MacArthur is a late builder. And I think in many ways, John MacArthur represents the tail end of the religious right. And, and I think what we see in some of Ben Shapiro, and, and that movement is, in fact, either the trailing end of the religious light, right or an attempt to revive it. So when you see Ben Shapiro, Dennis Prager, and some of that tribe, that's very much the legacy of the religious right. And I think some of what Marsden has to say about them continues to hold. But all of this is more broadly about the relitigation of the Enlightenment, where if you listen to Ben Shapiro and Jordan Peterson, amongst the IDW in particular, these are the two most ready to take a look at the Enlightenment and to say, maybe we need to go back to this and look at this again. The 1950s was an anxious, was anxious over the non-player character. The corporate man at work and the corporate man in worship were inauthentic. In the 1960s, which was 65 to 75, again, the 50s was 45 to 65, Marxist liberation, bipolar nature of the youth movement. You saw that. The last throes of establishment culture killed by Watergate and Vietnam. And so, as Marsden said, this was the, the twilight of the American Enlightenment. The 1980s then brought on the culture war, the rise of the religious right, conservative neo-modernism, I'll call it. And, and this is John MacArthur's kind of reform slash dispensational slash modernist fundamentalist in terms of how he approaches and understands truth and therefore how he interprets the Bible. You're, you've got baptizing founding fathers. Suddenly, founding fathers are great heroes of the faith rather than really, in some cases, like Thomas Jefferson, Enlightenment deists, and look to N.T. Wright's work at the Gifford Lectures on, on, on natural theology for some of that background. Then you have the rise of Ronald Reagan, politics and economics. So you have a conservative neo-modernism. Then you have the erosion of anti-Catholicism over um, the erosion of anti-Catholicism over the fight against Roe v. Wade. You should remember that some of the leading, the, some of the leading evangelicals and fundamentalists, when Roe v. Wade came out, were in were in support of abortion, and it's within a few years that they flipped and joined the Catholics on that, and it was very much that that coalition to fight abortion that really brought an end to the anti-Catholicism that was very much present in a lot of fundamentalism and evangelicalism. Some of that you can continue to hear in John MacArthur's talk with, with Ben Shapiro. You can hear John MacArthur lay out what had been, for the most part, the standard Protestant story about the truth in Christianity, that the early days of Christianity, back when the Bible was being written, these were the these were the great days, and all up until Constantine, Christianity was wonderful and pure, and then with Constantine, Christianity was corrupted by its union with state power, 
and that's in a sense where the Roman Catholic age starts and Christianity once again is purified at the time of the Reformation and all of the a lot of the bad blood that was created in the Reformation Protestants versus Catholic versus Catholics commends all the way into the 1970s when evangelicals flip on abortion uh, evangelic prominent evangelicals who initially came out in favor of abortion why if you read some of them they had a rather eugenics posture towards abortion initially but they flipped on it joined the Roman Catholics and at this point both groups as kind of a consensus become a political factor really brought together under Reagan and then later also again under under George W Bush with Karl Rove looking at the map and saying you know if we get all these evangelicals we can probably take this thing the, the, this is the storyline in terms of politics and religion that's being played out but Marsden's critique holds America is still wondering where its foundation is to afford this pluralism so so in a sense what the IDW is saying well science can afford this pluralism well that's hearkening back to the enlightenment answer and so among the IDW you have the truly the the enlightenment purists like Steven Pinker will be saying enlightenment baby get rid of that religious superstition Sam Harris is in there but then you've got Jordan Peterson and Ben Shapiro who are saying uh, there's we've got to come to terms with the enlightenment and we're not really being honest about the historical roots of the enlightenment in the Middle Ages and then in the middle you've got the Weinstein faction that are now, well, they're still kind of believing over with Steven Pinker and Sam Harris because they're not religious, but at the same time, they're looking the other way and say, well, religion is actually an adaptation, and, and we really can't forget that. Now, so what's happening on the right is the rise of the religious right. What's happening in the 1980s on the left is the rise of Friends and Sex in the City, where you have a semi-libertine social progressivism that really takes hold in urban areas. And now I grew up just outside of New York City in the 60s and 70s, and I went to, I went to Calvin College in 1981. So I spent the 80s not in New York City with with the friends and with the sex in the city crowd i spent the 1980s in the midwest at calvin college going to college and then seminary so actually it wasn't until 2006 that i had my first trip back to new york city in 2006 and remembering the city from the late 70s remember under a beam um, mayor a lot of you won't know this history under mayor a beam New York City actually was teetering at the edge of bankruptcy and you had mayor Ed Koch and all of that happening well I visited New York City in 2006 to visit Tim Keller and a bunch of and do some things do some things there only to discover holy cow New York is white and clean and it was of course um, it was, of course, our current president's lawyer who was the mayor of New York City and his broken window policy that cleaned up the city. But you also had this tide of all of these suburban kids pouring back into the city. All of You had the white flight in the 50s and 60s and the suburban rush. Well, this was kind of a going back in at that point. And so you have this new spirit. This was before AIDS. AIDS brought a certain amount of sobriety to the semi-libertine social progressivism that was really building by the, well, I suppose that would be the Gen Xers. That's the age group of the IDW. Now, Roman Catholics, and you, you hear this in Bishop Barron's talk with Ben Shapiro, and Marsden highlights it quite, quite nicely, Roman Catholics, Catholics embrace a denominational posture in America. And that's because Roman Catholics are laid on the scene in the United States. America is mostly settled by these groups, these separatists that were fleeing Catholic Europe and looking to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, like the pilgrims and the Puritans, or the economic adventurists down in Virginia who were making a whole lot of money on the new drug trade, the new drug being tobacco. So, and read again, 1493, if you want some of that story. 
So Roman Catholicism comes late to the American game, and one of the, one of their one of the consensus one of, one of the concessions they have to give in terms of being accepted accepted on the American political scene is that they become a denomination. Now that's a bitter pill to swallow for Roman Catholicism that at least in Western Europe had seen themselves as the church. Now don't forget that the split between East and West happened when the Pope excommunicates everyone in the Eastern Church and the Eastern Church excommunicates everyone in the Latin Church. So that's a pretty big split in the you know in the 11th century AD. But now America must be given in America they must give up their hegemonic ambitions. This is some of the same issues that Islam is having to deal now that they're going into Europe, into pluralist Europe. The Europeans aren't going to say, oh yeah, we're going to have an Islamist state in Europe. They're not going to tolerate that. And those are the issues that Europe is currently figuring out how to, it's really more like this, figuring out how to fight their way through. Listen to Bishop Barron, completely concede on church, no longer ruling state. That was a very interesting segment of his conversation with Ben Shapiro. American Protestants learned this game and the diversity of Protestant sects among the colonies becoming states. Roman Catholic politics and economics, listen to Baron on Francis. A lot of times Protestants have a hard time figuring out the Roman Catholic Church on politics because they can tend to be more critical of capitalism. And again, you hear that in the Baron Shapiro interview where they get into that because Shapiro and his, their in a sense, neo-religious right are very pro-capitalism. Pope Francis is going to say a lot of things coming out of Latin America that are going to be less excited about capitalism. That in some stance... Uh, is contrasted, as Bishop Barron says in that interview, with Pope John Paul II, who, coming out of communism in Eastern Europe, is excited about markets. So there are those things underway. Now, this, this basically is my ongoing critique of the Weinstein faction of the IDW, that I think in some ways they are naive. And they are naive because they are not talking they don't know enough religious people, and they're not very religious themselves. The ambiguities on first principles, and you heard Heather kind of flip-flopping. On one hand, we'll go all the way down to first principles, but then we'll have these other first principles that we won't give up on, like, you know, an unborn child. She's probably thinking of Ben Shapiro. Oh, but I don't have that one. Okay, well, for now, since you're a minority power trying to battle... The, the great big man with his golden glove with all of the gemstones in it, you're all united. But, well, this is the story of the Avengers, right? When they don't have a common foe to face, they splinter. And these are going to be the fault lines that these folks would fracture on if they hold together long enough to actually prevail. We will, with reason, search down to our first principles, but we can agree to disagree on the moral first principles. But for how long? Now, if you listen to Rogan and Eric talk, they'll talk about their FU money. And Eric and Rogan and now Jordan Peterson have FU money. Actually, Eric's is probably because he's well-situated with Peter Thiel, and so in many ways Peter Thiel is his patron, so Eric has financial security, and obviously his patron is fine with Eric going out and doing all of these interviews. Eric has not been pushed out of Teal Capital like Breton and Heather were out of Evergreen University, and that's because Peter Teal is a different sort of critter. Don't know much about him, didn't listen to the whole conversation on, on Dave Rubin, but that's, in a sense, why he has a stable platform from which he can talk and where he can he, they can easily talk about, well, no institution is making me talk. Yeah, but I bet if he was working for, I don't know, if he was working for Tim Cook, if Eric Weinstein worked for Tim Cook, could Eric Weinstein be doing what he's doing now? I doubt it. He works for a patron. He has a patron. The patron is comfortable giving him a certain amount of liberty. Jordan Peterson is on leave. 
everybody's been wondering how much lease does the University of Toronto have universities have at least a tradition of of giving professors some leeway well C16 ask the question how far does that tether go all of this gets back down to Marsden's point all of this has to stand on something and the question is is the Enlightenment a sufficient platform now you've got Peterson and Shapiro saying we've got our doubts well Ben Shapiro says no then Ben Shapiro will go all the way to divine revelation but then he will kind of bring it over and say, well, here we have these Judeo-Christian values. Peterson is Dr. Strange. <laughs> he's, he's, he's looking at the ancient text. He's thinking about spells. He's, he's, he's having visions of floating above cathedrals. And he's doing, you know, he's doing mandalas. And Jordan Peterson's Dr. Strange in the IDW. And yeah... Ben Shapiro, he might just be Spider-Man, as in the picture. Math and science won't replace the need to look at history and philosophy. And again, of the group, really, Peterson and Shapiro are the ones most earnestly looking at history and philosophy. Jordan Peterson is Dr. Strange. He really is. Ben Shapiro, Spider-Man. Always kind of at the outside of the Avengers IDW, out there spinning his webs, doing his own thing. You know, called on every now and then. But Dave Shapiro, Captain America? Yeah. Joe Rogan, Hulk? Absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> Brett Weinstein, Ant-Man. Again, Eric's not even in the picture. I don't know... Uh, I don't know what happened to Eric. Uh, Camille Paglia, Black Widow, and I always forget her name, who's the, uh, the Winter Witch. So here they are, Intellectual Dark Web Avengers. Now, why I think Jordan Peterson is actually the key to the IDW, and I don't think we would have seen an IDW, or none of us would have known about it, if Jordan Peterson hadn't emerged. Eric Weinstein is a terrifically smart man. And with him institutionalizing the IDW by branding it and giving it a name, he is a savvy, smart dude. Now, you'll hear me talk about some naivete about them in terms of history and philosophy, yeah. But don't misunderstand me about just how smart these people are. Eric Weinstein is a scary, smart man. I don't mean scary in terms of I'm scared of him. Politically... Me and the Weinstein faction are probably, I'm probably the closest to them politically. I grew up in the racial reconciliation era. I've always lived within the black community. This has been the community that has molded me. So in many ways, well, in, in some of these ways, in terms of American politics, me and Brett and Eric and Heather, we're all on the same page, okay? And I know that's going to cause some of you consternation. And yeah, there it is. But I'll be honest with you, it's just who I am. And and me and Dave Rubin, we're on the same page. Um, that's why I don't listen to the Daily Wire. It's not my political cup of tea. But again, if you go back and listen to the conversation that I had with, with Mr. Reagan, I am a religious believer and I'm a political skeptic. And so for me, the, religious is, the religion is dominant and the, the politics are flexible. But I think Jordan Peterson is the key to the IDW. Again, I'm politically closer to Sam Harris. Sam Harris is still imprisoned in the shining vision of peak modernity. But that ship has sailed. That sun has set. Same is true of Steven Pinker. Weinstein faction is brilliant, but I think naive when it comes to history and philosophy. Eric on Rubin. Uh, to hold together, he, he had this idea, and I haven't been able to find this clip. Maybe it was on Joe Rogan. One of these days I'll find this clip, but i got to listen to lots and lots of old video, and Rebel Wisdom keeps putting out new video that I have to digest and comment on, so that's my challenge. But I remember Eric Weinstein saying very forthwithly, the, to hold together ideas, um, the idea versus person tension practice, you know, that's what basically Heather said. And optimism in the face of, uh, of anarchy, you need to believe that everything will be okay. And I don't think 
I don't think atheism affords that foundation. What is the basis for that belief? He's an atheist, and again, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, rem I think I remember him talking to the fact that although he's an atheist, he continues to do synagogue. Well, why? Well, I think his elephant is feeding at the religious trough. And I think that is probably, the elephant is probably giving him some ballast to give him some optimism on this front. Only Jordan Peterson, I think, is knocking on the right doors. Brett Weinstein sees a door. Religion is legacy code that might have some value, but can't understand what we don't just say no to our code. Every time he says that, I stop and think, dude, you are so smart. How can you say that? We don't just say no to our code. No materialist would ever just say that. Please map out for me the stuff that Jordan Peterson is doing because I don't see you giving it to us and I kind of doubt you have one, which means you're just, are you just floating in on the assumption that the good is self-evident or you know it from inside your heart? It's constructed, baby, and that's where history and philosophy and religion, those are the sources of this. That's why we study those things. He doesn't see the he doesn't he doesn't really see the slipping into the monarchical vision as both fantastic and idolatrous because every time he takes a step back and says I can just say no to my code he's saying it from inside the monarchical vision and only God has that view. We need and use hierarchies because we can't see it all or ourselves really. And all this talk about hierarchies and see my last video on this we have to set up hierarchies because our con conscious sphere is limited and actions require immediate choices. And so we set up hierarchies and when we talk about good or better than or less than, that's when our hierarchies assert themselves. Dr. Strange, Jordan Peterson, is always a misfit in this bunch. Sam Harris says, I've done drugs too, but... What has he learned from them, except that his experiments in consciousness are purely recreational? And I think that's extremely telling. Peterson uses that amount of data and says, perhaps consciousness, the way we experience it, limits us, and perhaps the world is bigger. See the beginning of his talk with, with Sir Roger Scruton. Eric Weinstein's nominal Jewish practice is more determinative than I suspect he appreciates. The riders always underappreciate the power of the elephant. Well, let's get back to institutions. It, without individuals, nothing happens or nothing changes. Without institutions, nothing lasts. Why? Because truth be told, we reach our peak in our 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and then we disappear. That's a very small window. And it's via institutions that we can actually pick the brightest things that we do and test them and preserve them so that other generations can benefit from them. And when I say institutions, I mean corporeal, corporate, corp, body, corporeal and non-corporeal institutions. Non-corporeal institutions such as marriage, such as actually the IDW right now, because they don't have a board of directors and no one is drawing a paycheck from the IDW. Non-corporeal institutions matter. They matter a lot because what they do is allow others to benefit from past learnings. Corporeal institutions such as the Roman Catholic Church, the Christian Reformed Church, the United States government, Apple Corporation, these matter too. And they're always full of both. And this is where principalities and powers come in again. Part of the IDW's ability to smile through disagreement is because they lack a corporation. Married people fight mostly about money. Why? Because when it gets down to choices, when it gets down to scarce factors, 
That's when the rubber hits the road, and that's when people make choices either to hold together or break away, to get selfish or to be generous. They are, almost, they are also united by being exiles from corporations. Again, this Eric Weinstein is different in that because, again, if Eric Weinstein was working for Apple Corporation you would not, or Google, you would not see him out there having talks like this. He's working for Peter Thiel. You can see this played out in Bishop Barron and John MacArthur. John MacArthur pastors a non-denominational megachurch, and he's the senior pastor. His megachurch is a reflection of him. That's how non-denominational churches work. Bishop Barron is part of what now is a denomination which means he is under authority. There are certain things he will not say. There are certain times in that interview he goes to bat for the corporation. That's what people do. Now, here in America, we have the, fa we have the fashion, and this is all the way left from the non-player characters' conversations of the 50s. While we don't respect company men, okay, but... Do you respect a guy who's out there talking bad about his wife or talking bad about his kids or allowing others to talk bad about his wife or his kids? No, we respect people who stand up for family. Corporations are very large, very complicated, fairly watered down families. That's what they are. And you maintain your status in a corporation by sticking with the herd. It's a function of tribalism. Not all tribalism is bad. We need tribes in order to work. But we have to work. We're always working these tribes and figuring out in-groups, out-groups, whether the tribe is good, whether the tribe has become corrupt, whether the hierarchy has become corrupt. This is the map of human politics and human culture and human civilization. John MacArthur can say whatever he wants because he has no boss, really. He runs the show. Bishop Marin is a man under authority. Patreon. The Patreon moment is really important when it comes to the IDW. And in fact, as this morning, when I was re-listening to Eric Weinstein on Dave Rubin, I heard some stuff and I thought, oh, i got to pull this into this video. Why the Patreon moment is vital to the IDW. Money is what makes corporeal corporations. It is the universal storyverse link to this world. And I've mentioned this before, it's always amazing if you read the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says no one can serve two masters, and he doesn't say heaven and hell, he doesn't say God and Satan, he says God and mammon, money. Just this week, two days ago, Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin put out a little conversation on Patreon, Problem and Solution. I recommend that you listen to it. I personally am very anxious to see what they come out with. I've been thinking about Patreon. I have a little Patreon account. I've been thinking about Patreon thinking, actually, my consternation was less with, <sighs> that isn't even true either, because the more I looked into it, the more I was troubled by what I saw happening on Patreon. But I, I didn't really feel that I was in danger of getting kicked off. But I wanted to know if I was going to, in a sense, invest more in that platform and develop tiers and, and really use it as a vehicle by which I could pursue some of my dreams and goals for my own channel. And when I saw this pop up, I said, mm, probably not. i got to look somewhere else. So I'm very interested in terms of what Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin want to put together. What I wasn't thinking about when I was listening to them talk was this conversation that happened five months ago between Dave Rubin and Eric Weinstein. Now, listen to this conversation, now knowing what we know about what has happened in Patreon. You'll find this interesting. Yeah. So the idea is you're supposed to be able to hold a conference, let's say under the auspices of the National Academy of Sciences or Brookings or Berkman Center, or whatever it is, and you're supposed to say, well, earlier in the year we had this fabulous report uh, by Rebecca Lewis at the Center for Data and Society, and, and, and they're doing some remarkable work about how people are being radicalized, and I, th I think this is very important and pressing. 
And, and so you have a big serious conversation in a closed conference and you release proceedings and then maybe you'll allow the public in for the, for the final day and you say, well, thank you all for joining the conversation. Of course, none of those people in the audience is allowed <laughs> to join the conversation. Right. And that's what the gated institutional narrative is all about, that if you don't own a seat somewhere on the institutional network, you can't get into that conversation. So you, there's nobody who's going to be in a position to say, you realize that report uh, would not be acceptable uh, at any reasonable middle school uh, as, a, as a data project. So that's what they're, some, someone was hoping for this. But I think even for these institutions, they're going to be a little bit wary um, because it's so nakedly ideological and so piss poor on, on the analytics. Okay, so when I saw this thing come out and I called you and I was pissed and I was like, oh, here we go again, just another one of these things. And I was saying, you know, this is just their way of inching us closer to deplatforming. It may be. You think, but you think that's a secondary issue here? Well, what I'm trying to say is, and uh, by the way, thank you for having uh, my friend uh, Peter Thiel on. Uh, oh yeah, no problem. That was great. Yeah, we can talk about that too. Um, you know, Peter has this, this brilliant way of analyzing things, <clears throat> is that you have something that a powerful entity could do. Uh, and then he says, but the level of violence needed to accomplish that goal is probably not something that that entity could stomach. Well, I have no doubt that people are fantasizing about doing to all of these people what was done to Alex Jones. Right? With, with Alex Jones, there's so much over the top stuff that a lot of people whew, breathe a sigh of relief. Thank God somebody rid us of that terrible Alex Jones. Now, I'm not going to get into whether Alex Jones is good or bad. No, no, but putting. putting let me, let me yeah. con continue slightly. They could try to take the alternative influence network that they have identified off the air. Okay, what would that look like? Oh, that's the IDW, by the way. You've got to somehow get rid of Joe Rogan, Jordan Peterson, Ben Shapiro, Dave Rubin, Sam Harris, et cetera, et cetera. And we've got new kids coming up all the time who are set to be uh, major voices. So are you going to get rid of all of these people? Because if you do that, the only way to do that is in such a visible way. The, the way they can do this now is, is harassment through algorithms, where suddenly you don't get the number of views that fit the pattern, you're, you're demonetized, you can't make money, um, you know, that maybe there's a glitch and you're thrown off the platform and then they say, sorry, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So this is just like this, they're harassing us. It's digital harassment. So do you think that we, yeah. this IDW crew, whoever this is at this point, do you think we kind of dropped the ball on not offering Jones a better defense, not having anything to do with the content? I don't, I've watched maybe 10 minutes of him ever. So put the content aside, but that there was this digital assassination basically where it's like, all right, well, if this guy can't be on Twitter and can't be on PayPal well, and can't I, be I on said, YouTube, can he, can he have a phone? Is he allowed to have a phone? Well, I, is he, I, I can he have it. running water at his house? I mean, what, what is the Should line Republicans that be allowed to use streets? That's a good question. That is a good question. Where are we going with this? I don't know. Um, so should we have offered, not because we were defending him or any of his ideas, but should we have offered, man, these platforms doing this basically in conjunction with each other? Well, because it all happened. So then they decide, what if they come after Sargon? They did come after Sargon. Who's next? Happened, you know, within a 24 hour period. Yeah, I thought about this. I mean, I, I tweeted about it and I said something about this is ominous having nothing to do with Jones, that all of these platforms deplatformed him, deplatformed him sudden, suddenly. Yeah. Um, but my belief about this is that because the platforms occupy a very strange position, I don't think we have good jurisprudence around these platforms. No, we clearly don't. And it bothers me that we don't realize that the, the shift has been so dramatic are, are these companies, are they utilities? Are they natural monopolies because of the QWERTY problem of path dependence? So he's asking questions about institutions. What kinds of institutions are these? And, and how do these institutions relate to the dominant institution in our current secular state, which is the government? Um, I'm not positive that we have the economic theory, the legal jurisprudence, 
to just refer to precedents and say, well, this is a, a clear violation of the Sherman and Clayton Acts or um, that you know this is covered uh, uh, under New York Times v. Sullivan or who knows what. I think we're going to need a lot of new thinking. And so the problem that I'm having is I don't know exactly where to fight this. And fighting it around Alex Jones, particularly with the Sandy Hook mm -hmm. issue, strikes me as I want to be maximally effective. Mm -hmm. So I said I was very clear about t taking issue with the sudden deplatforming, but you know, t to the point where you're saying that businesses should be allowed to do what they want to do. Well, is this is this simply a business? And yeah. we, you know, keep in mind that we have very good information about how our government used to harass people who held dissident political perspectives in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But we've got no information about whether or not this is being coordinated through the intelligence communities. We don't know. I've talked before about Tim, and sometimes people call it time, for technology, intelligence, media, and if you add education, that is the universities and the research infrastructure. Um, that conglomerate, that, that association of major institutions, we don't know what we're up against. So how do we start thinking about this issue? I actually think that this issue that you've just laid out here, not just because it affects us in a very obvious way right. of how we're doing this, I actually believe this is probably a far bigger issue than anything going on with Kavanaugh right now, or certainly the other ridiculous political machinations, or half the stuff going on with midterms. This way that we conduct and transfer information and who and, well, sense and who you can get it and, and yeah well sense making comes on the back of our ability to communicate with each other and I think this is probably the biggest issue out there and by the way I'm glad you just called me out on it but this is where I'm running my classical liberal part that veers into libertarianism is starting where the rubber's meeting the road and I'm going maybe there isn't I don't want the government to come in no, you know no, that's no. against everything I stand for no it's not against everything you stand for look m m one of my yeah. goals is to get you off of <laughs> I think competition is still the answer, but I do no, think no, that we, we, we agree that where competition works, yeah. it is the answer. But if you are truly a free marketeer, you should know about market failure. Yeah. And you should not pretend that markets can solve all problems because you will have a world that is absolutely red of tooth and claw. Well, I right? think we're sort of heading there with this. I understand that. I but can't I'm, create a YouTube channel. But tomorrow. I'm trying to say that, you know, all I'm asking is that you reconsider your position because of the complexities about, you know, a path-dependent monopoly, which we refer to sometimes as QWERTY, mm -hmm. um, after the typewriter, uh, may have a funny structure. And it's not clear that we should break it up or not break it up or regulate it or not regulate it. These are open questions, and I'm absolutely... I, I agree with you as somebody who's much more in a, in a classic progressive position, uh, although that has nothing to do with what people claim, claim is yeah. progressivism now, right. that where the market works, you let the market work, yeah. right? But it's not clear that the market is meant to work here because the, the, there's too many asymmetries of information. I mean, Google holds so many of our secrets. Yeah. And so how do you know when the market is working? Again, with, with, with most of these, conversations well well it's working well well what's your measure for it working it's these it's these deeper platform questions that and and the seemingly as, assumed measures of them that I keep bumping into with with Eric and Brett what happens when they've got a problem and they can also read all your email and then you're thinking like, okay, well, that's a level of power. That's not like a company. You know, maybe somebody can invent some, some sort of email where the company can't read your email, but then the question is, are they responsible for regulating? Right, you know, who runs some, that? Yeah. Well, okay, but that's exactly what the data and society people are supposed to be doing or the, or the Berkman Center. The problem is, is that we have a situation in which it's as if the grown-ups whoever they are, held a conference, which we were not invited to. Mm -hmm. And they made a whole bunch of findings, you know, that, that these people are extreme, these people are good. If you think about it in, in terms of like the Hulk, the Hulk, you know, often talks in sentences that don't have one part of speech, you know, so like Harvard good, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Senate strong. Yeah. Um, well, somehow they have an idea that Harvard has our best interests uh, in mind that uh, more or less the Democratic Party is that which has to 
defeat Trump and the progressive agenda, and I put huge scare quotes around progressive here because it's anything but, Yeah. Um, that those forces, the grown-ups as they see themselves, uh, need to take this thing back. And my point to them is, are you aware of who you have in this alternative influence network? Because I think you're sadly mistaken if you don't imagine that the firepower outside of the institutional network, intellectual firepower, is as great or greater than the intellectual firepower inside of the institutions, which are constantly requiring people to say absolutely outrageous, ridiculous, false things. And so good people tend to eventually get so fed up that they can't stay inside of the institutions. And the magic of this alternative network, um, and, I, and I mean that in the good sense, yeah. uh, is that it's based around individuals. The main war is not left versus right at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's institutions versus things that are much closer to being in individuals. So the Rubin Report isn't just you, mm -hmm. but it's a team that is relatively small. Now, now, this is where you're going to get into principalities and powers. And so these conversations that I've been having with Jonathan Peugeot and I've done in my recent videos, corporations are like, in, are like individuals, except that no single individual runs them. There is a principality over that. There is a spirit of that corporation. And in fact, there are spirits over groups of corporations. And, and again, whenever I listen to these guys talk, I think, well, you've obviously not been paying much attention to what religious conversations have been talking about forever, because these are the kinds of things we talk about. And it also shows the kind of myopia, because Eric Weinstein will say, well, you know, the people on the inside of these institutions don't understand the amount of intellectual firepower in these alternative networks. And I hear that and I think, yeah, I'm used to that because what I've seen is that people in the imagined secular frame by excluding religious people don't have any understanding of the kind of intellectual firepower that is continued to be in these religious communities. There's a lot of smart people around and they don't all think like the principalities and powers of these narrow secular institutions that we have created and that we imagine define the real world. Mm -hmm. And these relatively small teams don't take on these terrible characteristics of the large institutions. And so the now we have the American suspicion of size, and rightfully so, but America is the hegemon. This is the Pax Americana, okay? So the reason that we're able to be so effective, in my opinion, is that all of the institutions are fighting um, certain problems having to do with, we don't have a, a really dependable source of growth, we don't have a great national story, they're all sputtering, they're all struggling. And the individuals... Again, back to Marsden's book, these are the same issues Marsden writes about, the angst in the 50s and 60s that led to the 70s and then 80s and then further on. Or where the vitality and the energy is. So if Jordan Peterson was giving us a biblical lecture on this right now, I think he'd be talking about David versus Goliath. And in this case, it might be Dave versus Google, but, but right? I mean, that's the idea that the small operation, the individual, or it can be just a small set of individuals, we have a lot of leverage because we don't have this cumbersome, cumbersome machine around us. And we don't, you know, I have to answer to myself and a couple other people that I hold in close confidence, but that's it. And that, that's nimble and that's great. It is nimble, but Alex Jones didn't answer to anybody else either. And really, John MacArthur doesn't answer to anybody else much. Bishop Barron does. And it's ironic because this entire conversation is framed as one of accountability, that there is a higher truth that they would like to hold the powers that be, the principalities and powers of Google and Apple and the New York Times 
and the mainstream media, media, they would like to hold them accountable to these higher ideals. Yet, these are a bunch of secularists. They're not comfortable in terms of dealing with higher ideals. Right. Yeah. So that's powerful. That's powerful. I've Even though it feels kind of scary sometimes. Well, but what are you writing on? You're writing... Great people, I think. No. <laughs> You're writing on um, internals, pipes, storage... Oh, you meant, you meant literally. Yeah. Right. We are still using their stuff. We're still using their stuff. And if you take this idea... You see, the deplatforming movement is quite clever. Um, because free speech is enshrined in the Constitution. So they can't really go around... Uh, you know, it's like, it's like somebody saying, you're entitled to play your guitar, your electric guitar, <clears throat> but we have the right to cut off your power. Well, you can barely hear an electric guitar uh, without an amp, right? And so mm -hmm. the platforming is, they, it's a failover into the next level of where can we take this fight. Mm -hmm. Again, I, I do, I'm doing a lot of kvetching here, but this dude is a genius. He really is. <laughs> That's a genius illustration. And I think it's very important that people read a... I think it's a transcript of a speech by the founder of Data and Society Institute uh, or Center, um, Dana Boyd, where she talks about two important concepts. One of one of in a speech, one of which is data voids, and a data void is some place where people want to search for something, but there's not a lot of information around it, and that's fascinating because. That's a lot of how the mainstream institutions control us. So I, I have a very clean example of this. The idea that you can be an immigration restrictionist and a clear xenophile, like everything throughout your life speaks to your interest in foreign cultures, mm -hmm. your openness to other people, but you happen to be a restrictionist. There is a complete void. If you go search xenophile restrictionist, mm -hmm. you'll probably find me at the top because what may be a majority position in the United States is acknowledged no. I, I want to, hang on, I, I've got to, I've got to do this. Okay, Google. Xenophile, whoops, my phone just turned on. Restrictionist. Kevin Shaw. Eric Weinstein on Twitter. Oh, he's number two. Whoops, I did Xenophile with a Z. That was very, it was very uneducated of me. Uh, you're number two, Eric. That's pretty good. Aware. Meaning that you might be into other cultures. You might even be married to an Indian woman. You might love all sorts of things. Speak a gajillion languages. Every time I get in a car with you, you're speaking another language. You might care about all these other cultures for a million other reasons, but it doesn't mean you want open borders. Well, Which it, is what most people think, I think. Well, it's very confusing. To, uh, uh, an analogy would be, um, do you wish to adopt uh, every person you have over for dinner? Um, <laughs> the idea of being open to dinner guests and expecting that as much as you love them, they will probably leave, if not after dinner, then after a few days or a few weeks. You kicked me out, but I was drunk. <laughs> you were drunk. All right, focus. Sorry. So, the <laughs> data voids um, are real, and they're created by the unwillingness to report. Now, this is what's radicalizing people. So that's right? what, that was one of the four types of fake news you originally discussed, right? Avoidance of an important topic is actually a type well, of fake news. Well, let's see if I can remember that. Yeah, let's so, see if you can do it. All right, so there was algorithmic, there was institutional. Give me, was, give me an example of each one as you're doing okay, it. Algori for, algorithmic fake news has to do with, there, there's something important, but you can't find it via, via search, and it's, it's downranked so that uh, it's, it's effectively suppressed <clears throat> and something else is accentuated. Um, there was institutional, where any institution that wants um, can uh, broadcast information and people treat it as if it's news, um, but individuals cannot do this. Then there was narrative fake news, where the New York Times is the principal offender here, which is that they figure out the, narr the narrative arc ahead of time and we, we don't know why they would do that because the, the facts haven't come in, but they have an idea of how the facts should be organized as they come in. Mm -hmm. And then there's just false news. Yeah. So these but, what, but wasn't one of them, oh, so the first one is what you're well, saying, where the, the algorithmic is the closest. Got it, okay. But sometimes that occurs just 
naturally. Like, what if nobody thought, why, aren't, why don't we have articles on xenophile restrictionists? Oh, we just forgot, we, we, we forgot about what may be a majority position in the United States. Um, but it's like, it's so large that it's pretending that you can't find an aircraft carrier in a, in a, in a community harbor. Um, <laughs> so that's what makes people crazy. So the, the, the big data voids, if you will, are people who believe that, um, let's say, that uh, trade is generally good, but that it isn't a rising tide that uh, raises all ships and that you have to do work around it to make sure you don't decimate communities and states. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there was very little um, real work done on what, what the effects of trade would be. Uh, immigration, we just mentioned. And then there's the, the I believe that there's a linkage between terror uh, and Islam, but I'm, I would th think Islamophilic because I'm fascinated by the culture and religion and uh, find it very easy to, to you know, socialize in that portion of the world because it's it's very similar to many of the values that I hold. We just had a great night with your, what, best friend from college who happens to be Muslim. Uh, damn well, it's like, who even noticed Yeah, this? it doesn't matter. Right. So happens happens to be is the is the older regime of tolerance as if a person's Islamic background doesn't contribute to the parts the other parts of them that you love. Oh the by creating these voids saying don't mention the following obvious fact, because if you do, we have an interpretation. If, if you disagree with us on policy, we can infer that you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. we, a moral failing will have to be affixed to your name in perpetuity. That thing is making people absolutely hate these institutions. And my goal in trying to unelect Donald Trump is to say, there is no reason that Donald Trump should be running the table by monopolizing these data voids. Yes, you can believe that there's a link between terror and Islam and not be Islamophobic. Yes, you can believe that we have a problem with the way in which we negotiate trade agreements and you can still want to be open to the world and not a protectionist at heart. Yes, you can be uh, a, a restrictionist and a xenophile simultaneously. Th the, those are my big three examples of what makes people hate the institutions. And in some sense, I've been thinking that Donald Trump is like a company fragging its senior officers. Like, we don't want to be led by people who tell us that we're deplorable because if you pee on our leg and tell us it's raining, we say, no, you're peeing on my leg, please stop, right? And those people who want to say, look, we are the natural guardians of America. We know who needs to be deplatformed. We know um, who, who shouldn't have access to PayPal. We should be able to write our terms of service in such a way that pure virtue is boosted and not niceness is pushed down. Right. And by the way, pure virtue is everybody I like and nobody I don't. <laughs> right, right. Right. Okay. Well, none of us want to be governed by this. Nobody who loves liberty and loves this particular country and loves the Enlightenment wants to be governed by this. And so this is an unwanted institutional class and we're trying to throw them off. What happened was it was so uniform throughout the institutions that they couldn't field candidates that spoke to this fed upness. I mean, we're just fed up. Who are, who are these baby boomers who are entitled to tell us how to think? The Enlightenment, who are these baby boomers? And I'm saying this as somebody who, who comes, you know, from, from the left. It shouldn't be uh, a left-right distinction. Yeah. More or less, people who have interesting perspectives as individuals are looking at this and saying, we know you're trying to get us off the platforms. We know your engineers hate us. Are you, are you reading our DMs? Are, are you going through our emails? What, what are you doing over there? And that's where this, the Alex Jones incident, the changes in the terms of service, so now like you can be thrown off of a platform even if you conduct yourself properly on platform because of your off-platform behavior. Yeah, a lot of people probably don't know about that. You we know about it now, Patreon. You are not making that well, up. Well, but this is the, this is what happened when I came on your show and I said, um, I said the, the fake news story is inauthentic. What I was doing was I was putting a marker and I was saying, watch this space, because what they're going to do is they're going to fill it with some kind of machinery. And so there's been a lot of changes. One, there are all of these reporting mechanisms. 
Uh, you've got loud groups who object to things. So you, you put them on a, a, a truth and safety council. And then the idea is that all of the squeaky wheels uh, who, are, who are upset with things, if you give them free pizza and you give them a place at the table, uh, they may shut up, but they're also doing this free work that probably often doesn't need to be done. I'm not saying that there isn't abuse on these systems, mm -hmm. but you want the abuse to be even-handed. If you have a hashtag, uh, like Ezra Klein brought up, uh, kill all men. Mm -hmm. Why is kill all men? Did, did you read this article that he did? I, I oh, didn't even, beautiful. I'm not, I'm not a huge fan of his, frankly. Well, Especially in the last couple of days. I, so, I find yeah. him quite personable. He's yeah. been very nice. Uh, I'm putting him on a list. He's had dinner at your house. I've had dinner at your but, house. But he's also been savage. He's on a list. But he's also been savage. So I'm better. Tr I'm trying to understand yeah. the perspective. Yeah. Right. So I'm trying to figure out: is the nice, intelligent guy uh, who came over for Shabbat dinner um, the same guy as the guy who's rationalizing kill all men? I didn't actually mind his rationalization of kill all men. What he said is, is that within a small group of feminist Twitter, which I don't think really exists, people talk like that, but since it's an open platform, it doesn't have any walls around it. Right? <laughs> right. He said that inside that community, that phrase meant it would be nice if the world were slightly better for women. So take, that, take him at his word. You would imagine that that same community, if it was epistemically consistent, would also believe, hey, we can't police microaggressions because we have to figure out whether those things are actually not as toxic as they sound. Mm -hmm. But that, this is what's fascinating, is we think that the same community that should object to anything, like you know, referring to mankind as bigotry, yeah. that community should also be allowed to use the hashtag kill all men. Now that doesn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. I'm very focused on are you granting yourself a privilege that you will grant to no one else? Because if you recall what created the Reformation, uh, it was the selling of indulgences. And I believe that what the left thinks it has is an indulgence system. That is, Sarah John, when promoted to the editorial board of the New York Times, should be granted an indulgence because she's actually a great person and she engaged in some bad tweetery and we should be uh, there should be compassion, there should be forgiveness, there should not be a black mark on the record. So basically, she believes in all the right things, according to the New York Times. She's she can person. say whatever she wants she's about white people, journalist. but she believes in, you know, she's a progressive and blah, blah, blah. But this other guy who once mm -hmm. said something which was ambiguous should be deplatformed for life. Yeah. And I don't think without profanity, uh, I don't think I have any way of, of communicating how hateful that is. How dare you? <clears throat> Literally, how dare you suggest that some community is entitled to own both of these things, ultimate forgiveness for their members and the right to police everyone else? Sure got theological there at the end. Okay, then let's pick it up here. We are winning at some level, but we are losing, we're not winning quickly enough and clean enough. Well, that's what I always say. What do I say to you every week? Mm -hmm. We're not moving fast enough. Well, okay, but, but it, it, this thing has its own pace. So somehow, mm -hmm. when the gated institutional narrative issues a report that tries to take you all out, um, next time, guys, first of all, assign somebody better than Rebecca Lewis because <laughs> she, she just doesn't have the chops yet, maybe, maybe in five years. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to come for us, come loaded for bear and, and do it intellectually correctly. Um, my concern is, is that the next moves are going to be highly personal. Like, how do we take out, you know, you saw this thing with Rogan talking about white farmers in Africa. You know, Rogan says some crazy stuff on his show. I'm not sure whether what he said was crazy or not, because I haven't looked at, at, at this. But I have no doubt that Joe holds some positions that are, that are off. I certainly hold positions that are off, no. and when I find them, I try to correct them. But suddenly, the litany of people going after him as if he's a racist because he even talked about this. Well, yes, and you know, Rebecca Lewis is very adamant that we shouldn't have gotten angry at Elon Musk for smoking dope uh, on the show. We should have gotten angry that uh, Elon Musk went on Joe Rogan because he, he gave a platform to James to Moore and Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson. I mean, doesn't that tell you everything? Th this kind of bananas uh, inside of this tiny little bubble stuff. Um, 
they're going to get more sophisticated. So just think about it as a video game. Um, we've been playing with like lots of low-level orcs on level zero, and okay, so then things got ratcheted up. This isn't terribly serious. It's going to get more serious because the, as the narrative comes to understand just how big these channels are, just how influential they are, let, let me be open about something. Part of the theory behind defining the IDW uh, has to do with my understanding of how demography works in presidential elections. So one way of winning an election is that you find a demographic that nobody knew existed. Mm -hmm. And then you speak to them, and they're large enough to sway things. So soccer moms. Mm -hmm. Remember soccer moms? Yeah. Okay. Another one of these things was Karl Rove's discovery of the exurb, where you have urban, suburban, something, and then rural. Mm -hmm. And between suburban and rural, there was this thing that nobody understood called the exurb. And so by finding that, you could find some demographic chunk. So both, and those are the evangelicals that Roe found. Both parties, uh, let me be very clear about this. The IDW nation is quite large. It's people who've had enough of low level lies. They don't mind adult level fictions that are in the best interests of everybody, but they cannot put up with this level of nonsense coming out of our institutions. And part of what's going on inside the institutions is that the institutions have a fake public facing front and then an internal group and, and this is how they, they handled things so like um, I think Danny Roderick talked about um, public voice and seminar voice mm -hmm. that as an economist you can say certain things to your colleagues but when you're talking to the public you have to say different things and unfortunately they don't even really mirror each other too closely <laughs> right and so it's okay to lie to the public and so when you talk to an economist and you say well you can't possibly believe what, what uh, that immigration and trade are pure positives mm -hmm. of course not well, but you just said that, or you allowed your colleague to say it, you stayed, you know, well, that's what you have to say in front of the public because they can't follow the analytic arguments. Well, okay, that's malpractice. That's mm -hmm. academic malpractice. You're engaged in academic malpractice when you do that. Um, whatever you say to the public has to be a version of what you're saying in private, or you're engaged in some kind of Potemkin statecraft. And if, if the idea is that we can't have a country because actually if you, if you took the Constitution seriously, it wouldn't work, then we have to talk about, okay, well, what are we gonna do that would work, that, that, that would actually be viable? But right now, what we have is we have a bunch of um, not very intelligent adults who are not very honest, who are sitting in the most important chairs telling us that we're all idiots and we're all deplorable uh, across this political spectrum, and that's not going to work, and that we are going to win that battle. So for all the people that at every Q&A that I do anywhere, either with Jordan or the stand-up shows that I'm doing, or we got, I think, basically this question. We, we did a little IDW. It was pretty awesome, actually. Within a day, we set up an IDW. There's an IDW group now, which they're springing up all over the place. This one sprung up in New York City. We did a, a room down on Bleecker Street, 300 people, standing room only. We did it for free, They, you know, whatever. But and are, are we grifters? I know, such grifters. We did it for free. Right. Uh, but, but putting that aside, uh, the question that consistently comes up is, okay, we get all this. People go, you know, get all the ideas. We're on board. We like what you're doing. We want to help. We're ready to, you know, show our faces and, and be part of this whole thing. We know there's a technological answer. How is it that you morons haven't come up with it yet? There's some version of that. Like, well, aren't you guys the ones supposed to be doing it? All right. Well, you and I have been talking and working on this in various ways. Let's just be honest about this. We haven't known when the right time is because the investment in trying to rebuild the infrastructure and then there's a question about how are you going you know if on the other side of this thing there really is a collaboration between technology intelligence and media uh, it doesn't make sense to build the system only to have it torn down uh, by people with special access um, in a non-competitive non-market kind of a way but make no mistake um, this is a viable concept I think it's going to happen I think it's important that it happened before 2020. Um, and the key, you know, people should know that there's a lot of billionaire interest in this. There's a lot, and, and I don't mean one person, I mean several billionaires are sniffing around this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Ben Shapiro just got uh, this show on Fox. I'll be on this Friday. Okay. So uh, this is going to heat up. And I think what's really important is to watch what happens to data and society as this particular um, report uh, finds its course.
Okay, shift to now. Dave and I are here today to talk about Patreon. And so I'll start. We've been engaged in a lengthy series of email exchanges with all of the people in our network. And no one is happy at all with what's been happening. And so we've been determining what our options are. And we looked at Subscribestar, but it looks like PayPal decided to cut funding out from them. And so it doesn't look like moving to an alternative provider, an, an alternative commercial pro provider that's out of our bailiwick, out of our control is going to be viable. So Dave, why don't you describe what we talked about today? Yeah, well, first, I think we should just make it very clear for everybody how significant what happened to Carl Benjamin Sargon of Akkad is. It doesn't matter what you think of him or whether you agree with him or any of that stuff. The banning of him for doing something that was not on the Patreon platform, that wasn't even done on his channel because of a word he said where he was using the word against the, uh, the alt-right or the neo-Nazis or whatever you want to call them is a massive move of that line of what's acceptable. Now, there's all sorts of debates we can have, and we've had them, of what lines should be, if there should be lines at all. But the fact that this guy got booted with no chance of recourse, with no warning, just, just like that, it, it's just an extension of everything else that we've all been talking also, about. Also, given that it, it's also the case that he didn't break patrons rules of engagement, the ones that they stated, and that Conte, had talked to you about the fact that that wasn't going to happen and that Patreon hasn't responded well to this. It well, look, look, he, Jack Conti came into my studio in my home and said, he, he said a phrase that I had never heard before, maybe you had heard it before, manifest observable behavior. So you had never even heard that phrase before, right? I thought, I thought maybe this was just something that went past me. Okay, now, of course, manifest observable behavior, M-O-B, mob, you can't yeah. make that up. I mean, yeah. that's a, that, there's no a kidding. real... <laughs> There's what a real the beauty hell, there. But, but so the point was that it had to be about behavior. And then in their terms of service, it also had to be about what was happening on platform. So at, at every firewall here of what would have been acceptable, Patreon failed. And they've put us in a position where, look, I, told, I called you last Saturday and when this was really catching fire. And I said, you know, Patreon is about 65 to 70% of my rev. That's, I have a company now with, with employees, you know, full-timers, part-timers. I was actually considering deleting it right then and there, yeah, which yeah. no one in their right mind would do, no business person would do. And I've, I've taken big risks in the past. You know, Before I was on Patreon, we were at Aura TV. I, I, me and my producer and my director, we all quit our jobs, lost our health insurance, all of it, to join Patreon. So I'm not, I like taking risks, but then I realized, all right, we, we have to figure out a plan. And that's exactly why we're doing this right yeah, now. Yeah, well, and we would have moved faster, but we... It, well, and I did set up a Subscribestar account, although I never quite finished setting it up, partly because Subscribestar seemed to fall apart almost immediately uh, yeah. under attack. And, and also, it wasn't obvious that I also read their terms of agreement, and it wasn't obvious that we weren't going to be just in exactly the same situation again. And there's only so many mistakes you can make before the mistakes start to become fatal. So we yeah. actually wanted to come up with a serious and, 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 and stable solution. And I've been working on for months, literally for months, it's been six months, I've been working on a system to allow authors and other people who engage publicly on intellectual issues to interact more effectively with their readers and viewers and listeners. And it occurred to me this week that with a bit of modification that that could serve exactly the function that we're hoping it would serve. So what we're going to try to do as fast as we possibly can is to set this system up on a subscriber model that's analogous to Patreon. It'll have a bunch of additional features, which I don't want to talk about right now, and I don't want to overpromise. but the system is, is because the system is new. But we're going to try to get that rolled out as fast as we possibly can. So and we have a number of people who are interested in, hypothetically interested in moving their, their subscription service over to it. Dave and I are very seriously planning to do this as soon as we can do it in an intelligent way. And so, yeah. But, and, yeah. and you, know, you know, by the way, one of the interesting things here, we haven't talked about this, but I'm guessing your experience is just like mine. The amount of emails that I have received and, and of course, tweets and everything. So very interesting, the, how this thing has come together. The alternative web, they seem to be here. Social capital becomes financial capital. Rogan, Sam Harris, Jordan Peterson, Dave Rubin, 
all of them downstream from them, as, as Eric Weinstein said, what happens when they shift? What happens when the money moves? At our Jordan Peterson meetup, I quipped to someone that, you know, one of, one of our members was saying, yeah, you know, if, if, if companies really want to get mean, you know, they, they won't let you use a cell phone. They won't let you have an email address. You know, these, uh, these, these gatekeepers could do some pretty powerful things. And I said, this person doesn't know much about the Bible. I said, yeah, did you know this is all written about in the book of Revelation? Of course, kind of scared him. But I was a little tongue in cheek. But the second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands and on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666, which obviously pulls up in a, in a lot of movies. Is that the number of Google? Is that the number of Patreon? I'll get back to my PowerPoint. I lost my PowerPoint. Oh, we've got to go all the way to the end. The question again brought by Marsden as we come full around is a strong enough foundation. Now the IDW is thinking of setting up their own. They don't have to run through the pipes of Google as Eric Weinstein reminded Dave Rubin. You're running through their pipes now and you'd often find Dave Rubin complaining on Twitter when Google demonetizes a specific video and for what? It's very interesting. Is there a strong enough foundation? Well, foundation for what? If you go all the way back to the beginning of this video and Heather Heyer's arguments about morality, because again, it all came down to morality. We can follow these first principles back and, and look at all the weak links, or sometimes we discover that there's a first principle that we won't violate. Well, here's the question. How do you know where your first principles come from? In what way can you examine your presuppositions? How can you believe and act as if everything will be okay? This is, this is Eric Weinstein's standard. Everything will be okay even when the wrong seems to have the institutional power ruling the world. What if they don't let you buy and sell? How can you disagree without being disagreeable when the disagreeable person is in fact not just sort of nudging you away, but maybe actually doing you harm. See, part of the last night I was watching, my, my wife is a elementary school teacher. Right now she's teaching middle school. And they did a, a version of Fiddler on the Roof. And the Fiddler on the Roof, well, how do you live as a Fiddler on the Roof? Because you're playing and you're on a roof which has a peak. How do you do that? Tradition. Well, what does that mean? You look into the past and you see what can we gain from the past because what is present today has been there in the past. And how can we how can we work on this tradition? Is it is it that well we kind of relegate the past because well they had some wisdom there, but see the problem with that is you trust yourself too much to know your own to know what wisdom might be. How can you disbelieve without being disagreeable? How can you still believe in God in the gulag or the death camp? What does it take? So I want to close this video reading the epilogue of Tim Keller's Making Sense of God because in it is an amazing story of, you might remember, Eric Little. But first we begin. Langdon Gilkey grew up in the most enlightened, educated environment possible. Born in 1919, he went to elementary school at the University of Chicago Laboratory School, a progressive educational institution founded by John Dewey. Gilkey's father was on the faculty of the University of Chicago, as were the parents of half of the school's students. In 1939, he graduated from Harvard magna cum laude with a degree in philosophy. Next year, he went to teach English at the university in China. When the Japanese overran the region, 
where he was teaching, he was put under house arrest with other Westerners and finally sent to an internment compound in Shangdong province. Gilkey survived his experience and wrote about it years later in the book Shangtung Compound. A wall with electrified barbed wire surrounded the compound along with a guard tower filled with sub with machine gun armed soldiers. It was about the size of a large city block. About two and a half acres yet contained 2,000 people. His personal living space consisted of a bed with 18 inches on either side and three feet and three feet at its foot to which he kept all his possessions. In that little world, nine feet by 54 inches, each single person had to keep intact all of his possessions and at the same time somehow maintain his own personal being. Food was extremely scarce and salvation was poor. There were only 20 or so toilets, none of them flush, for 2,000 people and so the lines were perpetual. The ordinary symbols of status, money, family, pedigree, education, did nothing to change one's status or living space or influence in the compound. No one could accrue or protect any privacy. Most of all, the prisoners' very lives were always in doubt under the constant harangues from their captors and the guns trained on them. Like most bright, educated young people, Gilkey had a view of life, a set of beliefs about human meaning, nature, and purpose. He began his time in the compound with the confident humanism so characteristic of liberal academic circles. He described that as consisting of two basic parts. First, he believed in the rationality and goodness of human beings who had the, in, who had the ingenuity to solve basic human problems. Second, he saw religion as merely a matter of personal taste or temperament, essentially only if someone wants it, and useless to achieve the broad concerns of the human race. He believed secularity and its techniques, its courage and its idealism is quite able to create a full human life without religion. Why, I asked myself, add religious frills to the ethical commitments? Notice the ethical commitments come first for Gilkey to the moral absolutes of peace in the world and justice in society. These are the assumptions. These are the moral assumptions. They can't base them in anything. It's just conventional wisdom. Everyone, they assume, believes this. Everyone except, it seems, their Japanese captors. These moral commitments, he thought, did not need religious frills for support. In fact, religious beliefs distracted people from what was really important. Gilkey's first couple of months in the compound seemed to confirm his secular humanism. When 2,000 strangers suddenly found themselves thrown together, they began to organize themselves, discovering what every person was trained to do vocationally and put everyone to work. Challenges of food preparation, sanitation, health care, all were met with ingenuity. The actors and musicians created a stage and put on arts events. Also, people learned new skills. Those who had never seen a mason's trowel built clever brick ovens in their rooms that not only heated the room, but baked a modest cake. All of this confirmed his beliefs that the capacity of human beings to develop the technical aspects of civilization know-how is limitless. I knew I would never again despair of man's ability to progress in both knowledge and practical techniques. He felt that human ingenuity in dealing with the problems of human life was unlimited, whereas the metaphysical issues that religion and philosophy pretended to deal with were irrelevant. But the rest of Gilkey's account reveals how thoroughly his secularity was dismantled by his unusually up-close two-year confrontation with fundamental human nature. People began to steal coal and food, and no amount of public shaming could stop it. If you look at what the this is me again, I'm pausing the reading. If you look at what the primary belief system of the SJW movement is, it's shaming. That's what it's about. How dare you talk to such and such a person? How dare you? The lever it moves in people's hearts is pride. So, if you're going to stand against it, and your main weapon is pride, you're just giving the enemy his own tool back. To continue reading. Fights broke out over space and distribution of goods, and those, with, and those with marginally more of these things fiercely defended them rather than sharing. Crisis after crisis occurred that involved not a, that not an, not a breakdown in techniques, but a breakdown in character. 
The trouble with his humanism was not its confidence in science and technology, but its naive and unrealistic faith in the rationality and goodness of men who wielded these instruments. What he discovered was that all human beings were intensely self-interested and selfish, but found the most ingenious way to cloak those motives in moral and rational language. He called this the essential intractability of the human animal. And it, is not, and, it, and it not only was a problem for the people from the lower or less educated classes, but characterized the missionaries and the priests in their midst as well. He realized that this created a great crisis for their micro-civilization. These moral breakdowns were so serious that they threatened the very existence of our community. In particular, very few people seemed regularly capable of self-sacrifice. But that was what was required. I began to see that without moral health, a community is as helpless and lost as it is without material supplies. One of the most instructive incidents came early in his time as the elected head of the housing committee. Eleven single men living in a small room discovered that there were nine single men living in an identically sized space. They went to Gilkey, asking what one of them were allowed to move into the other residential room, so that there would be ten living in each one. Gilkey was pleased. Here at last was a perfectly clear-cut case. Surely the injustice in this situation was, if it ever was in life clear and distinct, anyone who could count and measure could see the inequity involved. He assumed that the average man, when faced with a clear case of injustice, will at least agree to rectify that injustice, even if he himself suffers from the rectification. And surely, he reasoned further, we are all in common difficulty here, like persons on a raft at sea. So he assumed that the nine residents of Block 49 would agree with him to accept the new resident, if not enthusiastically. On the contrary, they did not. Surely we're sorry for those chaps over there, said one. But what has that got to do with us? We're plenty crowded here as it is, and their worries were all tough luck. Gilkey passionately argued against what he called the sheer irrationality of nine men in one room and eleven in the other when they both were the same size. It seemed only rational to share fairly, and he argued to do so was ultimately in their self-interest, because this way they could count on fair treatment if they were in a position to need it. Gilkey, of course, was speaking and later writing before John Rawls' influential book that, almost, that argued almost in identical ways. There was no need to appeal to anything but rationality and self-interest to establish a peaceful and just order. Isn't that same Harris? The, block, the men of Block 49 heard Gilkey's excellent logic, and one replied, that may, well, that may be, friend, but let me tell you a thing or two. Fair or not, if you put one of them in here, we are merely going to heave him out again. And if you come back here about this, we're going to heave you out too. Several others tried to take a more moderate tone, but they were just as adamant against that move. They tried to engage Gilkey's argument, finding ways to explain why, there was not, why, why they were not being impractical, unreasonable, or unjust. As Gilkey went home, defeated, a thought struck him. I almost laughed aloud when the queer thought struck me. Why should a man wish to be reasonable or moral if he thereby lost precious space. What obliged a person to be rational? If you argue that to be rational is simply to be, to be in your best interest, well, you are appealing to no higher value than selfishness. So why shouldn't the person act selfishly? Rationality and logic were, then, were insufficient to bring human beings to agreement and to move them to action, that promoted a social good. Something else was needed. Gilkey came home that night confused, shaken, and losing, and losing faith in humanity's basic goodness. Self-interest seemed also omnipotent next to the weak claims of logic and fair play. As the months went by, he constantly faced the same self-centered intractability, namely that the fundamental bent of the total self in all of us is inward, 
towards our own welfare. And so immeasured are we in it that we hardly ever are able to see this ourselves, much less extricate it ourselves from our dilemma. People never could admit to themselves or others what they were doing. They always found afterwards rational and moral reasons for what they had already determined to do. The most moral and religious person, people, like everyone else, found it incredibly difficult not to say impossible to will the good, that is, to be objective, generous, and fair. Some power within seems to drive us to promote our own interests against those of our neighbors. Though quite free to will whatever we wanted to do in a given situation, we were not free to love others, because, they will, because the will did not really want to. The Shangdong compound was stripped away, had stripped away the masks of politeness. The thin polish of easy morality had worn off. In more comfortable settings, people can feign the virtues of justice, compassion, and integrity. But in the compound, to be truly fair and rational, just and generous, required the sacrifice of some precious good. And that did not come naturally to anyone. Shang Dan showed that true virtue is extremely costly and goes deep against the grain of human nature. Gilkey had been taught in Chicago and at Harvard by teachers who believed that when the chips were down and humans were relieved as they humans were revealed as they really are, they would be good to one another. He now saw that nothing could be totally that nothing could be so totally in error. If the social order was to improve or even survive, people had to be capable of virtue. But in their natural state, they were not. In the compound, Gilkey found true virtue to be rare indeed. Gilkey discovered a number of ideas for which he had been contending in his book. He saw that Western secularity was not just the absence of a belief, but a new set of beliefs. Those beliefs include the goodness and rationality of human beings, and especially the sufficiency of an aided human reason to guide us towards the goals of peace and justice. This worldview, these beliefs, could not stand up to the reality of human nature and human life under less than ideal circumstances. He saw that rationality alone could not give people a basis for moral obligation. Why should people make sacrifices for others, especially if they could not see how it benefited them? Not only that, Gilkey saw an intractable inclination to selfishness and cruelty in the human heart that simple appeals to moral ideas could neither dislodge nor even enable people to see in themselves. This led Gilkey to a, Gilkey to a radical reversal in thinking. It was a rare person indeed in our camp whose mind could rise beyond that involvement of the self in crucial areas to view them dispassionately. Rational behavior in communal action is primarily a moral and not an intellectual achievement, possible only to a person morally capable of self-sacrifice. In a real sense, I came to believe moral selfishness, selfishness is a prerequisite for the life of reason, not its consequence as many philosophers contend. In short, if we are going to live rationally and use our minds well, we need new hearts. We need something that draws us out of our desperate search for self-fulfillment, affirmation, and value, and makes us capable of loving other beings, not for our sake, but for theirs. Gilkey came to believe that only faith in God could do this. Human beings need God because their precarious and contingent lives can find final significance only in his almighty and eternal purposes, outside the iron box of secularity, my edition, and because their fragmentary selves must find their ultimate center only in his transcendent love. If the meaning of people's lives is centered solely in their own achievements, these too are vulnerable to the twists and turns of history, and their lives will always teeter on the abyss of pointlessness and inertia. If men's ultimate loyalty is centered in themselves, then the effect of their lives on others around them will be destructive of that community on which we all depend. Only in God is there an ultimate loyalty that does not breed injustice and cruelty, and a meaning from which on earth and heaven 
and a meaning from which nothing on earth and heaven can separate us. Again, this is Tim Keller. My wife, Kathy, and I originally discovered Shang Tung compound because we, were, we understood that it contained an account of Eric Little, called by the pseudonym Eric Ridley in the book, the former Olympic star and missionary to China whose story is told in the movie Chariots of Fire. Little was a prisoner in the compound and died during his internment. Gilkey candidly described how other missionaries and clergy in the camp were fully as selfish and ungenerous as others, and in many cases more so, because they often accompanied their behavior with sanctimony. But Little was different. Gilkey makes a startling statement about him. It is rare indeed when a person has the, for the good fortune to meet a saint, since he came close since he came as close to it as anyone I've ever known. Little was especially concerned to minister to the teenagers of the camp. He cooked for them, supervised recreation for them, and poured himself out for them. More than anyone else there, he was overflowing with humor, love of life, sacrificial kindness for others, and inward peace. When he, sudden, when he died suddenly of a brain tumor, the entire camp was stunned. Little was a committed Presbyterian missionary who believed in Christ and that his salvation was accomplished by God's sheer and free grace. Gilkey wisely points out that religion, all by itself, does not necessarily produce the changed heart capable of moral selfishness, selflessness. Often religion can make our self-centeredness worse, especially if it leads to pride of our moral accomplishments. In Little, we had a picture of what a human being could be if he was both humbled, yet profoundly affirmed, and filled with the knowledge of God's unconditional love through undeserved grace. Gilkey, quoting Reinhold Niebuhr, says, Religion is not the place where the problem of man's egotism is automatically solved. Rather, it is there that the ultimate battle between human pride and God's grace takes place. In so far as human pride may win the battle, religion can and does become one of the instruments of human sin. But in so far as there the self does meet God and so can surrender to something beyond its own self-interest, religion may provide the one possibility for a much needed and very rare release from our common self-concern.